Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're putting pigeons through their paces. They're being painted, ejected and sedated. We've got a little bit of gun dog training. We've got our deer DVD. We're determined you buy it for Father's Day. We've got a lot of fox shooting and we've got Don Heath, professional African hunter, on what to do when a lion charges you. First, here's Mark Kilchrist on how to set up your quad bike for rabbiting. Mark earns his crust making game pies, an event catering through his company Game for Everything. He also sells rabbits to London restaurants. The great demand means he's developed a style and technique of shooting rabbits which works from a sporting and a catering point of view. OK, I'm going to show you how I set up a quad for shooting rabbits at night. First thing I've got is a box. It's got some holes in it to let the blood drain out. And I wedge the box between the frame and the manifold here. So as I go along, I can put 10, 15 rabbits in here. Then when they're, um, I've got that full, I'll, I'll gut them and then hang them on strings off the back of the quad. The next thing you need is one of these, which is a sandbag, but don't fill it up with sand because you'll never be able to lift it. This is linseed and I'll just put a couple of loops in there to stop it bouncing off. Um, the farmer very kindly gave me some of his linseed and I've got a lamp, a basic red lamp. Um, I've taken the cigarette lighter thing off it, which normally goes in there. Almost all quads have got a screw fitting on to take um, you know, electrical take off to run you know, things like a sprayer or a slug pelleter. Um, and it's much better if you can hard screw these into something like that because they very rarely come out and you always get a better connection. The last thing you want to be doing in the middle of the night is fiddling with the uh, cigarette lighter connection. Uh, I just got a Cyclops lamp here. Uh, it's very basic, it cost me 40 quid. Uh, I've run it over three or four times. I've dropped it in water, covered it in blood. Uh, I've hung it by its handle a few times. It hasn't really gone wrong for me, apart from uh, I've pulled the wires out of the handle, which is not really the fault of the lamp. It's more what I've done to it. Um, this has got a very dim red, wide red beam, because all I'm using it for is for spotting. Okay, so I drive along um, like that with the lamp going. As soon as I see a rabbit, let's say 90 yards away, turn the lamp off, drive another 30 yards closer to the, to the rabbit, chuck the lamp down like that, stop the, the, the quad, put your, there's a foot brake on here, put your foot on there, and this is the important bit. I've got my two elbows on the handlebars and the rifle rested like that. So there's, you're very, very steady as you do it. You, what, what you don't want to do when you're, ever, when you're night shooting on your own is get yourself into a situation where you can't get steady. I mean, you see people leaning on car windows like this. You're wasting your time. You've got to be able to build up a good position. And I like this because, you know, I'm steady like that. I can get my hands anywhere in here, get nice and steady and shoot the rabbit. You can also, if you're going down orchards, which we might do a little bit of tonight, you can lean forward and get your elbow on there and get a rest like that. So you can shoot pretty much 360 degrees, which if you want to shoot a lot of rabbits and do a proper job for a farmer, you, you kind of got to have that kind of setup. Okay, I've got a CZ22 here, just basic. Uh, I've got synthetic stock, because as you can see, mine's been through the walls, especially if you look at that bit there. Um, it's been bounced out, it's been run over a couple of times. Uh, and it's still going, still shoots nice and true. Um, I've got Pulsar N55 digi sight here, which hopefully you're going to be looking through this evening. Um, I rate the, the scopes very, very highly actually. Uh, for a thousand quid, you're well away. I think they're a bit cheaper now than when I bought them. They've got an illuminator, which is, I think if you've got the money, I'd go for a Laser Lux one, um, and then you're really amplifying the power of what you can do with your scope. And I've just got a basic, you know, moderator on it. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, I just practiced with it a few times and that's why we get the results. So with quad, night sight, rifle and light all working, we head off to see what rabbit life is left around this particular farm, which Mark has already hit hard. Tonight, he's mopping up, not wiping out. We've plugged a camera into the night vision so we can pick up some of the action. 
Mark uses a red beam to spot, then drops the light and fires up the night vision. For just a little potter around a few fields and an orchard, we don't do too badly. And if nothing else, he has film evidence to confirm to the farmer he's doing a good job. All that's left is to make sure the quad is returned as clean as it was found. Now, one thing we do on Field Sports Britain is try and bring you the tricks of the trade. We're visiting the lovely Roy Lupton. Not only has he got his latest brood of goshawks, he's shooting foxes and he's training his pointers by dizzying pigeons. Roy's house is not normal. A giveaway might be the goshawks having lunch on the breakfast bar or the large ball of twine sitting next to the kitchen sink. Tied to the other end is a trap door. Roy needs to nab some of his father's doves for the various activities he has planned for us this afternoon. The reason that we're trying to catch these pigeons is because uh, we've got obviously in the off season for hunting at the moment and so the dogs will be a little bit rusty so what we're going to do is go, and go out take some pigeons out um, because we haven't got anywhere to work the pheasants or partridge plus this time of year. Um, we don't really want to be pushing pheasants around or partridge around because they'll probably be nesting so what we'll do we'll take the pigeons out, dizzy them up put them in the fields and then um, just brush the dogs up a little bit to uh, get them pointing on the pigeons. So hopefully that's what will happen. Just took, got to take up the slack. Oof. <laughs> All right, now we've got some pigeons. Now we've got to try and get them out of the trap without losing them, which is easier said than done. So I shall use my large bulk to block the doorway up and then hopefully they can't get out around me. And the, I mean, the good thing about doing it this way is uh, obviously we can take them down the road not far away so they're in their territory um, and they fly off and they're straight back here within five minutes to carry on feeding again. So uh, yeah, they, uh, they do us a favour and uh, they get fed in return. With the doves bagged it's time for a makeover. A quick rustle in the cupboard and we soon have the equipment needed to create colour coded <coughs> pigeons. Now ingredients that we've got for the pigeons today are food colourants. So we're just going to colour a few of them up. So really just so as we know, yeah, don't want almond flavouring, um, just so as we know which ones that we've used um, and just make sure that they're coming back really. So uh, obviously if we go quite a distance away when we're uh, doing the dogs then uh, some of them might not come back but we just want to make sure that we're not taking them too far. It's obviously quite good with white pigeons or white doves because it shows up very well. So we'll colour them, we'll do a few of different colours so as we can tell which ones have come back etc. Right. And obviously this will just wash off in a few days time so it doesn't cause them any harm. Foxing is also on the agenda today, so Roy cleans the rifle. It's an important routine to get into. After speaking with a, a very good uh, rifle shot, um, he, always, he, he told me that I should always shoot my rifles from clean. So when I start with a rifle, um, or a, a new rifle, a new barrel or whatever, I'll always bed it in. So I'll take one shot with it, not, not bothering what it's doing at the target, but just take one shot with it, clean it. Take a couple of shots with it, clean it. Take three or four shots with it and clean it, and just do that. Um, for the first 50 or 60 shots so as the rifle the rifle gets bedded to being shot from clean and so then what you do is, is I'll only shoot a maximum if I can if I can help it if obviously if we're doing park culling or something like that when you might be shooting 15 or 16 animals um, in a very short period of time you might have to stretch it but ideally I always try and shoot um, or only only put through you know maximum 10 rounds through a rifle before I clean it and then start again. So then we put a, a fouling round back through it, so just to reset the barrel and uh, make sure that it, it's bedded in again. And then from there, we should be uh, set and back on the target. For the dog training, Roy takes us to a cornfield near his home. He's got some kit from Dogtra, which he wants to play with. What we've got here are um, Dogtra pointing collars. Now, they are an e-collar, but they're not just an e-collar, 
they've got all sorts of different bits on them. They actually let out an audible beep um, for location. So if the dog's working in thick cover or if we're working on the mountain and we're in inclement weather and we can't find the dog, then we can press the button and it will actually let out a huge um, loud beep so we can, we can find out where the dog is. So a lot of the times if a dog is on staunch point, um, as I say, in, in thick woodland or out on the mountains where we can lose them behind rocks or whatever else, then with the, the, the dog tracker collar here, by pressing the, um, the locate button, I'll show you, hang on, green, let's just turn it on. Right. So by pressing the uh, locate button on the dog collar, if the dog is anywhere that we can't find it and we're, we're, we're desperately looking for it, we press the button and it lets out a, a very, a very uh, audible beep so then we can find out where the dog is. He thinks the electric collar is a useful tool despite its unpopularity and even though it is now illegal in Wales. I find it a terrible shame um, if people are going against them because as a training aid um, they are they are superb and also for the, for the dog's safety as well because with some dogs they can be very headstrong and if you're working a field and the hair gets up some dogs are very difficult to stop and they'll chase it and if you've got no way of controlling the dog and bringing it back or stopping the chase then it could easily run into it run over a road and get run over it could run over railway lines um, it could get lost so there's an awful lot going for an electric collar um, a lot of people say that if you train your dogs properly then you don't need to use an electric collar but in certain circumstances that if a dog chases and it doesn't matter how much training you've done if that dog just has a momentary lapse and starts running off then it just gives you a little bit of a backup so you can keep control of the dog if something does go wrong. With the dogs wired up we get to see the pigeon hypnosis. Less look into my eyes more look under your wing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dizzy the pigeons up put three or four out on the field and then we're going to work the pointers into them hopefully they'll be, they'll be alright with this uh, this wind gusting the way it is um, and then the dogs will work into them what we do as soon as they're on point we go round we head the point off come into the pigeon as if it was a game bird and then we go in to do the flush so what I'll do is I'll just show you what we do we just take said pigeon tuck his head under his wing there's all sorts of different ways of, of dizzying pigeons this is just a, a very quick simple way and then all you do is you take said pigeon and you put it on the ground with his head under his wing and then what we do when the dogs come on point all we do is we roll the pigeon over and then remove his head from under his wing he wakes up let him get his bearings a little bit and then go in for flushing before Cooney gets her run Ian wants to do some Not training with his young cocker Ebony First, he wants her to retrieve a rabbit and stop on command. She's showing real promise. Now it's time to test if she'll keep calm after flushing a bird. Time to bring out the ejector sling. What we've got here, as I say, is a pigeon release mechanism. And it doesn't hurt the pigeon whatsoever. So the pigeon just goes in to the harness in here. You can get pheasant sized ones, you can get partridge sized ones and what have you as well. This is a partridge sized one. So as I say, pigeon goes in there. And then what we do is we just bring the release bar up over the top. Where is it there? It's there. We bring the release bar up over the top there and then it's ready to go. Ian starts at the top of the field and works down. She again does well and when Roy deploys the bird, she stays put. Here's a second go in slow-mo. Time to dizzy the white pigeons and hide them in the crop. Just wipe his scent around a little bit. So he's down there, up against the cover. We've seen Cooney used before as a deer hound. She needs to multitask and this is ideal training during the off-season. The wind is strong and swirling. She seems to pick up and then lose the scent. Roy brings out the more experienced Atos, who helps show her the way. Yeah, what we were doing there, um, as I say, where we were struggling with the wind, um, Cooney, as I say, is quite inexperienced and she's quite hyped up as well. She's just coming into season. So a lot of the, with, the, with most of the points that we had, um, then they, they had a little bit of scent and working it in, but they were getting very close so that in the end they were sight pointing. 
Um, and when they were sight pointing, I was just getting the pigeons, or you know, with the with the pigeons waking up, and then just move the pigeons forward. And then it's Sit. just again just re uh, reinforcing the control of the dog, making sure Sit. that you've got control when the pigeons walking forward, and they're they're not going forward and flushing until you ask them to. But actually, what I was doing there was going in and I was flushing the pigeon myself, or going up and picking the pigeon up myself. And it just takes the dogs out of the equation. They realise that I'm in charge and. Uh, they've got to wait until they're, they're asked um, to do whichever uh, task I want them to do. With the dog work done, Roy sends Ian out with a target to ensure the rifle is zeroed. There we go. So they're about an inch high, a hundred, which is about spot on, that's what I want. All is well and we're ready for some foxing, but not before heading back to the house for a cuppa. But look who's back before us. And there's another visitor too. Don's got a box of goodies for Roy to test. So uh, we've got a bundle of new kit that's turned up uh, in the office and um, we wanted to take it out and test it. So Roy's taken over the uh, foxing pages on the magazine. He's our fox shooting expert. So we've got a few devices in here um, which are targeted at the fox shooting market. Um, and rather than just write up a press release, we like to get the, uh, the products out in the field, being evaluated by people that actually know what they're talking about. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to give some stuff to Roy and he's going to try it out later today, hopefully. With the kettle on, the guys have Go a look through the toys. Bear, crow, this looks like some kind of creature in distress. Wiggles about and yeah. then so away oh, we go. It's got a tail. Um, oh, that needs a... That's open, is it? Don't need a shave, Roy. <laughs> Dom leaves us to it and we head off after those foxes. We get togged up and Ian is carrying a second camera so we don't miss that elusive daytime fox shot. Roy has both shotgun and rifle with him. The first farm doesn't deliver and we move on. We're not messing about. Between the sunshine and the showers we want to make the most of the day. Farm number two gives us fox number one. From behind a plough he appears and Roy wastes no time. We return to the dog training field as we'd spotted one earlier, but again no joy. Time for a field Roy has been watching for a while, but he has only just got permission to shoot foxes on it. There has been a vixen and he thinks he spots her on the bank. We crawl to get a clear view. Roy calls her in. Another clean kill, and to his surprise, it's yet another dog fox. We've had three dog foxes in this field in the last week and a half, and I was sure that was going to be a vixen out, to, out hunting at the moment, but it's another dog fox. So uh, just goes to show how many there are about. That's a shame, we'll have to carry on for the vixen now. Roy has saved the best location until last. Lying on top of an old quarry, we get a fantastic view. We spot one under one of the large bushes, but it disappears before Roy can get a clean shot. Then another darts from below the cliff we're lying on. Roy squeaks it, but it accelerates to the far edge of the quarry. He stops, and Roy takes a 220-yard shot. And it looks great from way above the quarry, on top of the quarry. We decide to fire up the new electronic call to see if we can entice the other fox out. We see movement, and after a few minutes, out pops fox number two and number four of the evening. Again, another great shot made all the more impressive by the location. All it needs now is for obedient Ian to descend to the cliff face and retrieve the foxes. The first one came out underneath us on the bottom of this bank here, um, but he'd unfortunately that one had centred us where we are on the top. He'd obviously come round behind us and our wind's blowing right down there, so he, he centred us and then took off like a scalded cat across the, uh, the opening of the, the quarry here um, and just stopped over in the distance there. He was just on 220. Um, luckily, I, I got a shot off on him, so he was down. Carried on squeaking, um, and it's amazing, even after a shot has gone off um, and echoing all the way around the quarry, you would have thought it would be finished, but 
then the other vix or the the, uh, the other fox i'm not sure if it was a vixen or a dog came trotting out from behind the bushes and it was very very cautious slowly working its way around uh, behind the bushes here wasn't quite sure if it wanted to come in or not um, and then just showed itself at the top there and uh, we got her as well so four foxes in one evening well, i think we'll call it quits on that now for the last in our series from professional hunter don heath here's how to avoid a charging lion We're going to talk about lions. Okay, it's an all too typical scene encountered in the Zambezi Valley, well, in fact, in many parts of Africa. Um, you've got a professional guide who's taking a group of tourists on a walk, and on the anthill, you've got a lion bouncing up and down, starting to growl and shout at you. And again, it comes down to reading body language. Is this going to end up in a shooting, or is it, in fact, going to end up in an awesome photographic moment? And happy tourists. Is it about to make a meal of your tourists? No. Nope. One, it's a male and most males are full of bluster and not very full of following through. That sounds familiar. Yes and you can read as with all animals the more experience you have the easier it is to read the body language um, and tell the little telltale signs. Um, a lion always thrashes its tail before it charges. Yeah. It always does that, except when it doesn't. Um, now what's the next picture? Is that, is that more serious? Yes, this is a lioness coming in. She has had enough of everybody. Um, she was the auntie looking after a group of cubs. She's not the mother. Uh, the mother's retreating with the cubs and the auntie is putting in an absolute determined charge. Oh. That one's first, the cub's in the background, she's shouting, she's annoyed, and now it's gone from annoyed to you're on the menu. And when you mean on the menu, I mean her next action will be to bring down a tourist and, and carry it off? Yeah, she's going to hit somebody. And of course, the moment somebody runs, they are the target, uh, particularly with lion, their typical cat. The moving target is the one that gets followed and run over. And as a guide, photographic guide, you don't want, one, you don't actually want to shoot anything. Um, that's not what you're trying to get your, that's not the whole object. And two, you certainly don't want one of your clients eaten. That's very bad for form and they don't pay usually if that happens. They don't tip anyway. No, no. Uh, um, did you, what happened to that line? Did, 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 did you shoot uh, it? Unfortunately, yes. We had to. Right? Uh, yeah, it uh, wasn't going to stop. Now, surely you'd shoot this lion? No, that's a male, a magnificent black maned male coming in. And if you look at his eyes, he hates you. He has thoughts about your mother. But in fact, if you read the body language, he is skidding to a halt. The paw is turned in. He's starting to scoop up dust. He's going to use noise and dust and try and intimidate you. And it's quite intimidating. Um, he, he achieves it quite well, but he is un He's not going to press that home. And do you have time to look at him and say, hmm, turned in poor, I don't think he's serious? Again, the legislation is 10 yards. If he's inside that you and you shoot him, you can claim self-defense. The reality is that most lions will pull up closer than that. So he's going to pull up six to eight meters away. And as a hunter, you shoot the wrong animal, it comes off your hunting quota. As a photographic guide, at least half your clients are anti-hunting and shooting an animal is not good for business. No, no. So again, the tendency is to leave it too late. And if they don't change their mind, ah, you know, a male lion always stops, except when he doesn't. Um, so in fact, and you've got to learn to watch the feet, particularly on a lion. If you look at the eyes, they're always blazing hatred. Right. But that doesn't mean anything. So uh, what happened to that lion in that case? Oh, we got some awesome photos and he walked away. Um, <laughs> that's how it should end when you're doing a photographic tour. Oh, that's a slightly unusual picture. 
Yes, it's a very sad one actually. Um, people always have the impression that lions are the killers and that the hyenas scavenge from them. This lioness was trying to raid a leopard kill, which the leopard had hidden up in the top of the tree. Uh, she had climbed up to steal the leopard's kill, fallen down, got stuck and died, wedged in the fork of the tree. Um, so the notion that lions do their own killing, no, there is good a scavenger as the next one. Well, not that one. That's a, no. bad, that's a bad scavenging. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and this photograph to end on, you're, you're taking a liberty here, surely? Uh, yes. Um, these were lions being rehabituated to the wild. They were not unused to people. Uh, it's one of the dangers, actually. They've been around people. They know people and they're not afraid of people. Um, you can therefore approach quite closely and people make the mistake that they are actually cute and cuddly when they are not. Surely you're making that mistake there. You can't see it. I'm ca well, you can just. I'm carrying a handgun. I am carrying a rifle. I've also read the body language. They are relaxed. I've come up slowly. I don't have one of them behind me. Even if they're tame, turn your back on them kneel down so that you are lower than they are, you're asking for trouble. These are lying down. I'm taller than they are. I don't have my back to them. I walked in forwards. I walked backwards to get away from them. It's reasonably safe. <laughs> but kids, don't try this at home. Well, from a man who really cannot miss to unmissable DVDs. We've got foxes, we've got deer, we've got pigeons, and you've got Father's Day coming up. If you want to enjoy more pigeon action, why not visit our DVD shop page and buy our collaboration with ex-sporting shooter editor James Marchington. In Pigeons, the Expert's Way, we talk you through hide building, decoys, and we get some great tips from top British shot, Andy Pye. And once you've filled the freezer, game chef Mark Gilchrist shows us how to prepare that huge bag of birds. Also available is A Year of Deer, Volume 1, 12 Months, 6 Species. We've been lucky enough to go out with some exceptional stalkers and film some incredible deer being stalked. We've chosen the best of the bunch. It's stuffed with great advice and great stories. There's the fallow stalk with the added excitement of an aggressive dog walker throwing abuse as we take out an injured buck. And rugby league legend Kieran Cunningham describes his first red as better than scoring at Wembley. Finally, we're foxing with Robert Bucknell and James Marchington. In this DVD, Robert gives us a fascinating insight into an animal he's dedicated his life to understanding, enjoying and controlling. From calls to lamps, rifles, shotguns and ammo, we visit an incredible range in mid Wales to test ourselves and the equipment before going out after this most cunning of quarry. It's 90 minutes of tips, techniques and action in daylight and at night. Visit our website www.fieldsportschannel.tv and click on DVDs. We're back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, which is just there, I think, or might be there, or possibly there. Now you've got to turn over to the BBC, which disturbingly shows no scenes of shooting whatsoever.